Hi, Jack Lipton here, and this morning I'm very pleased to be speaking with Marina Smith, the Managing Director of Australian Strategic Mineral. Uh, good morning, Rowena. Good morning, Jack. Oh, I just remembered it's good evening for you because it's good morning <laughs> for me. It is oh. It is evening here. Well, we last spoke at PDAC in Toronto a few months ago, not so long ago, and uh, I, I was very impressed by your business model and, and how, you, how you're moving along it because, in my opinion, you're actually the furthest advanced uh, rare earth company in Australia. There's a lot of uh, much, let's say, one larger and many other wannabes, but you're really moving along and you've got the right business model. So what I what I'd like to ask you is, where do you stand in your your operation of producing metals and alloys? I'm particularly interested in that. So. Can, can you tell us about that? Indeed. Well, our metals facility um, is in South Korea, and right. we have been in production there making light rare earth metals since uh, 2022. We first started delivering a product to customer in September of 22. And um, then uh, from that point, that was originally that light rare earth metal, but then we've also developed the NDFEB alloy, the strip alloy that is that specialist alloy that is the feedstock for the magnet producers. And um, the first of the customers that we announced on that are in the US, uh, but we've been progressing with a number of prospective customers through the product validation process. Um, and I'm very pleased to say since we last spoke, Jack, that we have now sent commercial samples, uh, which is the very last step in those product validation yes, right. processes, We've sent large commercial samples to three different customers just in recent weeks, one in Europe and two in Korea. Um, so we're very pleased that we're getting towards the end of those processes and we'll be able to move into sales for those customers uh, in the coming uh, year. Well, I've, I've, I've spent too much time in, in uh, Global 1000 companies uh, to, to ask you to identify your customers. I know you can't. Uh, not be, not that you don't want to, but they would be very unhappy. Okay, mm. but but you've actually told me something very interesting um, because you're telling me that there are magnet makers in Europe and Korea who are well along in in getting into production again. And right now, we really don't have too many of those. So, like in fact, uh, you've just increased my understanding of the Asian magnet market by about a hundred percent because I didn't know there were two Korean companies okay doing it so thank you <clears throat> also you are the only company I know of in the Western world who is doing wh what you're talking about now let, let me say something uh, you're telling me you're delivering strip cast alloy to uh, sample to, to prospective customers Okay. Absolutely, we are. And, um, you know, the, the customers that we're working with in Korea are emerging magnet producers, so they're not in production yet, uh, but we're working <clears> with <throat> them uh, as they are establishing their facilities. Uh, you know, the customers, so some of the customers we're working with are established and others are, um, we're working with them to support their startup processes. Um, and that includes in all jurisdictions. We've got um, examples of that in the States as well. Um, but, you know, I think what's exciting about uh, this is that we are seeing businesses stepping into the magnet production. And, you know, we are positioned very strongly to actually know what it is that's going on in the industry because there are so few businesses that are producing the metals that we are one of the obvious places that people come to talk to um, as they're working through their own processes. So it, it puts us in a unique position to have uh, the intelligence <laughs> around who's working on what, um, which, you know, is terrific for us. Well, I, I want to correct you on one thing. You're the only company at that level, not just 
some one of them. Okay, I, I'm t if we just take China off the board, mm. then ASM is leagues ahead of everyone else in the in the world space. And I, I want to emphasize something. I realize you're not yet mining and 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 refining, oh, and, and oh, but you're you've got a very big interest from the Australian and the American and Canadian government on financing your, your form, the core mine of your company. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's, it's exciting to see the downstream part of this supply chain starting <clears> to <throat> move, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it will only be as strong as it can access feed. And, you know, I've said this before, you know, these businesses will only grow the, the metals and magnets businesses if we invest in projects like our project in Dubbo and New South Wales, so that there is actually feed of oxides to come into these metals facilities. Um, so we have got a project that is extremely advanced. It's construction ready and, you know, funding is critical path for us. And when we spoke in March, I said then, you know, we're really focused on talking with government about accessing some of the government funds to be able to facilitate are getting double into production. So um, yeah. it's been really exciting. Just in the last few weeks, we have had a letter of interest that we've announced from US Exum for $600 million US for the construction phase of that Dubbo project. We have awarded a contract for the final piece of engineering work to Bechtel Engineering. And with it, uh, we got an accompanying additional letter of interest from US Exum for a further up to $32 million US uh, to help in that final piece of engineering work. And then uh, more recently, um, we got a letter of interest from the Canadian Export Credit Agency for $400 million for the construction um, phase of the Dubbo project. That's in Aussie uh, currency. And all of that is in addition to the Australian Export Finance um, a credit agency who had already given us a letter of support for 200 million. So, you know, we really are starting to get very, very strong signals from our Australian and North American governments uh, for support for this project. And what we have immediately seen as we anticipated is that's just triggered stronger interest from other jurisdictions uh, as well as other engineering companies who are wanting to participate, as well as the off-take discussions that we had underway, uh, are, are um, you know it's just triggered a, a stronger level of interest, which is great. You know, you, you hit on something that's that's so true. None of this is going to happen unless the supply chain is in place. And I, I keep telling people, it's not just the supply chain; it's the volume of ability, production ability of the supply chain. So the fact is, we're not going to be able to advance any faster than we can develop metal and alloy capacity for for making magnets. As simple as that. If that's if we don't buy metal and alloy from our friends in China, then we we have to produce it ourselves. But this has been something we have not been doing. And what's interesting to me is that in the United States, it's, be, it's been seen now to be very difficult to do this because we don't have the people, you know, I, I, I'm 84, okay? And I'm not the oldest guy who's been involved in the rare earth uh, magnet industry production, okay? So and when they asked me at the Pentagon what they should do, I said, visit the assisted care homes the cemeteries and the active retirees and see if you can find enough people to put it together. Okay. And, and so I, I recommended they work with the Department of Health because those are the ones who know the people of my generation. And in any case, they thought that was, you know, not funny. I said, it isn't funny. Okay. So the fact that you found this kind of talent and you've achieved it, it, it actually you're the only one I know that's doing this in the, at this time in the Western world, okay? Uh, I'm not counting Japan because, in my opinion, Japan has outsourced almost all of its metal and alloy making to China, okay? So um, you guys are it, 
Okay. It's very, very exciting for us. And, mm. you know, you're right. There is, there's a lot of work to develop the capability in each step of this supply chain. You know, mm -hmm. you talk about the expertise in metallization, in alloying, but, you know, equally magnet, um, as well as if you go upstream to separation and refining, these are right. all their own specialist IP. And so, you know, I think if we are going to establish this alternative supply chain rapidly, then we, you know, one of the ways to de-risk that is to work in partnership across that supply chain, not try to have one jurisdiction or one company trying to do all of that alone and simultaneously. Uh, but, you know, let's work together and see what we can do to establish one step and then leverage that for the next. So for us, we've gone out there and we've established that capability in metallization and alloying. It's then uh, enabling us to work very closely with both the emerging magnet capability, but also um, in addition to our own project for oxides, it's also allowing us to work with other third party oxide providers and we're giving them a pathway to market as well. And what we've found in the discussions, particularly in the United States and Europe, is that there is very strong interest in us replicating that metals plant in their own local jurisdiction as that supply chain matures. And, um, you know, we are uniquely placed to be able to do that because we have got not just the design of the facility and the experience in building and commissioning it, but we've got the personnel, both the operational and technical personnel who can come and support the training of local talent to be able to bring them up that curve. Um, so, you know, all of that's very, very important, but but it's also an opportunity for, you know, if a magnet producer in the States, for instance, is trying to commission at the same time as the metals plant is being built alongside them and commissioning, you've just doubled the complexity of that process if they can um, actually build their plant and commission it, sourcing from an established, capable, reliable supplier from Korea, and then as the supply chain grows, we can install the additional capacity locally. Uh, you know, that's a much safer way for us to be building uh, this capacity in the supply chain. So they're the, the type of conversations that we're having. Can, can you give us an idea of what your alloy production tonnage might be at the end of 2025 and 26? Well, the design capacity of our facility in Korea is 3,600 tonne per annum of um, alloy. We've installed 600 tonne per annum of that at the moment. Um, and we're in the process of um, you know, going through these product validations to then establish the sales to ramp up firstly to that 600 and beyond. And we'll install that additional capacity to take it to design as quickly as the market supports it. Um, there is um, already a sort of a blueprint for how we would expand beyond that in Korea. Um, and certainly if the market really supports it uh, in Korea, then we would be very excited to do that. Uh, but similarly, we could we could uh, just work to getting to the 3,600 tonne in Korea and then duplicate that capacity uh, in another jurisdiction as another way of expansion. Uh, and that we've certainly got a lot of interest in. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Rowena. And uh, you don't need luck, uh, you need money. And I'm hoping that comes, comes to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Good night.